Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockets OGTV. My name is Jim Jacobson and my pen is working again. Uh, you're listening to Grocket.com. We're doing the GMAT edition of the official guide to the exam, and that's the 12th edition. They've put out 12 editions so far, so um, make sure you have the right one. Even though some of the same questions appear in the guide from year to year, they also add new content, and of course the concentration of questions changes uh, to reflect the current thinking on what the exam is, and it's made by the makers of the test, so they ought to know. So last time I ran into some pen trouble at the end, um, I ended up... Uh, just uh, two questions, one or two questions short, so I have to try and squeeze those in this time. So I'm going to go a little bit faster, but hopefully not too much faster. The question we ended up with last time was question number 98 on page 281, and so I need to start with question 99 on page 281. As always, I write down on the side what each of the answer choices stands for. Um, one is statement one alone is sufficient, two is statement two alone is sufficient, T stands for together they're sufficient, E stands for either one is sufficient on its own, and N stands for neither, neither one is sufficient on its own, alone or in combination. So number 99, each of the letters in the table above represents one of the numbers one, two, or three, and each of these numbers occurs exactly once each row and exactly once in each column. What is the value of R? So we have R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. And each of these represents one, two, or three. So this is actually kind of like a Sudoku puzzle, if, if you've ever done one of those. Um, each number can appear only once in each row and column. And we want to know the value of R. So we'll just circle that one. And let's see what else we get in the statements then. We have no other values though, so we know R must be 1, 2, or 3, but we don't know which one. Statement 1 says that V plus Z equals 6. The only way V and Z, because all of these numbers need to be 1, 2, or 3, the only way V and Z can equal 6 is if V equals 3 and Z equals 3. So if Z equals 3 and V equals 3, um, we now have a 3 in this column and in this row. We have a V in, or 3 in this column and in this row. Um, basically, leaving the only other place a 3 can be being right where R is, so R equals 3. So this one is sufficient to tell us, yes, uh, R equals 3. So we can cross off statement 2 on its own, as well as uh, the two statements that require statement 1 to be insufficient. Statement 2 tells us that S plus T plus U plus X equals six. So that's uh, S plus T, let's put boxes around them, S plus T plus U plus X equals six. And basically this amounts to something very similar. Um, every single row and column, every row, every column has a one, a two, and a three. One plus two plus three equals six. So, um, basically what this tells us is that um, S plus T equals 3 and U plus X equals 3. Because again, we can't use a 3 and a 1. Um, if, we, if we use a 3 in any one of these places, um, the only way we can get this total to, equal six to sit, total to equal 6 is if we use 1 more than once. Um, which causes us problems then for the value for r, which would then cause us to choose something other than three for r, which means which is not possible by the rules of the of the of the set. So this tells us that s and t are one and two, or two and one. Uh, one and two, or two and one. U and x are one and two, or two and one. And once again, r equals three. Statement two. Is also sufficient so we can cross off A and circle D with confidence. On to number 100 where I think we should have finished off last time. So page 281, question 100. 
So if x in brackets, which is, this is basically just another type of symbol question. So if doing this thing, this operation to x, denotes the greatest integer less than or equal to x, is doing that to x equal to zero? Good question. So we need to find out more about x before we can determine whether this equals zero. Statement one tells us 5x plus 1 equals 3 plus 2x. We can subtract 2x from both sides, so we get 3x plus 1 equals 3, and um, subtract 1 from both sides, 3x equals 2, so therefore x equals 2 thirds. So uh, the number, the integer, the nearest integer less than or equal to x. So basically, if x is an integer, it stays the same. If x is not an integer, it goes down to the next integer below. That's what this operation up here is telling us. If x is, if that symbol is equal to the integer less than or equal to what x is now. Um, since x is not an integer, when x is 2 thirds, it goes down to the next one. So the next integer below 2 thirds is zero, so this is sufficient. We can cross off B, C, and E. Statement two tells us that zero is less than X, which is in turn less than one. This tells us something very similar. I mean, of course, we have to ignore what we just heard in statement one, heard in our heads, I suppose. So, but since X is less than one, but greater than zero, it's between the two, and then so that, that means that x is not an integer, okay? Um, if x were an integer, it could stay the same. Since it's not, <clears throat> one is the next highest integer, x becomes the next lowest integer, which in this case is zero. So this same operation performed on x, according to statement two, also gives us zero. Also sufficient, so we can cross off uh, a and circle answer choice d. Page 281, question number 101. So material A costs $3 per kilogram and material B costs $5 per kilogram. If 10, if, if 10 kilograms of material K consists of X kilograms of material A and Y kilograms of material B, is X greater than Y? So um, A is uh, $3, $3 per kilogram, B is, why do I keep doing that? $5 per kilogram, and then there is X amount of A and Y amount of B. Is X greater than Y in K? We also know from the original, I'm going to erase this stuff because it looks sloppy and confusing. Okay. So um, we also know that um, 10 kilograms of material K have been purchased. So the amount of X and the amount of Y add up to 10. So in order for X to be greater than Y, X has to be more than half of 10. So really what this is asking is, is X greater than 5? If x is 5, x and y are equal, and the answer is no. If x is less than 5, x is less than y, and the answer is no. <clears throat> Only if x is greater than 5 is x greater than y, because the two of them together equal 10. Let's look at the statements. So uh, the first one says y is greater than 4. That alone isn't enough for us to determine sufficiency. Um, because, uh, for example, x could equal 5. x and y could be equal. So x, y being greater than 4, if y equals 5, then x equals 5. But x is not greater than y. Otherwise, we could say, um, you know, y uh, equals, well, 6. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, and then x equals 4. Anyway, we don't have enough to determine whether x is greater than y. We just know that x is either equal or 
um, less uh, in statement one. So statement one is insufficient. We can cross off A as well as E, or D, which is E. <laughs> okay, E for either. Statement two, the cost of the 10 kilograms of material K is less than $40. So we can use some of those cost numbers to see what this ends up being. Three times the, the number of, of kilograms at x plus five times the number of kilograms at y is um, less than 40. We also know um, that x equals, um, do we want to use x equals? I think we want to use y equals y equals 10 minus x because x plus y equals 10. We can subtract uh, an x from both sides, y equals 10 minus x, and we can substitute this equation into our new one from uh, statement two. So 3x plus five times this value for y is less than 40. We multiply it out, 3x plus 50 minus 5x is less than 40. We want to subtract 40 from each side and, and add 5x to each side. So 3x plus 10 is less than 5x. We want to subtract 3x from both sides and then just kind of switch the direction. 5x, oh, excuse me, 2x is greater than 10. x is greater than 5 which, from our original figuring, the only way x is greater than y, since the two, add them at, two of them add up to 10, is if x itself is greater than 5. And that's what statement 2 tells us. So statement 2 is sufficient. We can circle b and cross off c and e. Obviously, on the real test, you don't need to cross off the, the other answer choices that you are eliminating when you have found the correct answer. Still page 281, question number 102. While on a straight road, car X and car Y are traveling at different constant rates. If car X is now one mile ahead of car Y, how many minutes from now will car X be two miles ahead of car Y? So they're traveling at constant rates, car x is ahead. We are assuming that car x is going faster than car y. We need to know how much faster than car y it is going to determine when it reaches another mile ahead. So uh, we don't really have any other information other than um, that it's one mile ahead now. So car x, statement one says, car x is traveling at 50 miles per hour and car y is traveling at 40 miles per hour. So that means that car x is 10 miles per hour faster. Which means that um, it will go one mile. If, it's, if, it, if it travels 10 miles an hour, it travels um, one-tenth of an hour when it goes one-tenth of 10. So one so that means it goes 10, if it were to travel an hour, it would be 10 miles ahead. We need it to be one, mi one more mile ahead, so we just move the decimal point over one. The amount of time required for it to be one mile ahead is one-tenth of what it would require for it to be 10 miles ahead. One-tenth of an hour, you divide 60 minutes divided by 10, you get six minutes. If it's going to be one, one hour, 10 miles ahead in one hour, it'll be um, one mile ahead in six minutes. That's our answer. In six minutes, car X will be two miles ahead of car Y because it's already one mile ahead. So statement one is sufficient. We can cross off B, C, and E. Statement two, Three minutes ago, car X was one half mile ahead of car Y. So three minutes ago, in three minutes, it has gone half a mile because three minutes ago, it was one half mile ahead and now it's one mile ahead. So if it goes 
three minutes, one half mile. We want to know how long it, that means it takes six minutes to go one mile. And there's our answer. If it's one mile ahead now and it's traveling at a constant rate, it'll be another six minutes and it will be another mile ahead. So this one is also sufficient. We can cross off A and identify D as the correct answer. Page 281, last one on 281, question 103. If a certain animated cartoon consists of a total of 17,280 frames on film, how many minutes will it take to run the cartoon? So we have 1, 7, 2, 8, 0 oh, frames. And we want to know how long it will take to run. Assuming that it is uh, filmed or uh, shown at a constant rate, we simply need to know uh, how fast those frames travel by, either in frames per second or frames per minute, and then we will divide that 17,280 by the rate, and that will equal the time. So, statement one tells us the cartoon runs without interruption at the rate of 24 frames per second. So to figure out how long that would take, we would just multiply or divide, excuse me, that 17,280 times 24 frames per second, and then divide it also by 60 seconds per minute, that equals uh, the number of minutes. We don't have to do the math, we just have to know that we could do the math, it's purely arithmetic, so uh, that statement is sufficient. It's not B, C, or E. It's an M for frames per second. Statement two, it takes six times as long to run the cartoon as it takes to rewind the film, and it takes a total of 14 minutes to do both. So if we let R equal the speed of rewinding, the speed of rewinding, um, it takes six times as long to play it, so six times the rewinding speed equals 14 minutes, that means that 7R equals 14, and the time to rewind is 2 minutes, and the time to play the film is 6 times that. It takes 12 minutes to play the animated cartoon. So this is also sufficient for us to answer the question, so it is D and not A. On to the next page. So 282, question number 104. At what speed was a train traveling on a trip when it had completed half of the total distance of the trip? Um, so this is instantaneous speed. We're looking for how fast was the train traveling at a particular point. So how fast was it going when it was halfway? That's a little bit tougher to tell, but let's see if the statements give us what we need. Let's write that down. How fast? Halfway. Basically, in order for us to answer the question, we're going to need something from the statements that tells us its speed when it was halfway finished with its journey was one was some ratio of its average speed, or some operation performed on a speed that we're given at some other point in the journey. So statement one tells us the trip was 460 miles long and took four hours to complete. 460 miles divided by four hours equals 115 miles per hour. However, that's the average speed, not how fast it was actually going at halfway. Um, it could have been going much slower um, in the first quarter of the journey and then sped up one quarter of the way through for the middle half and then slowed down for the last. It could have been going at constant speed the whole way. 
without knowing um, what the what the actual speeds were that led to this you know average speed of 115 miles per hour we don't know how fast it was actually going halfway through so this is insufficient it's not a and it's not d statement two the train the train traveled at an average rate of 115 miles per hour wow well tell me something i didn't know um we also know that the average speed was 115 miles per hour which we just figured out and so uh, that's clearly not sufficient because that's the average speed. Remember, things that are higher and lower than the average can go into making an average. So it's not going to be B. In conjunction, the two statements tell us exactly the same thing. We really would have needed the speed halfway. Um, speed halfway was uh, 1.5 times uh, the speed at the end, you know, which was some number. We would have needed an actual number for a particular point in time and the halfway speed in relationship that for, to that for sufficiency. So these two statements in conjunction, they tell us the same information, and that, that means that the answer automatically had to either be um, D or E, depending on whether that same information was sufficient or not. In this case, not. Two eighty-two, number one hundred five. So Tom, Jane, and Sue each purchased a new house. The average or arithmetic mean price of the three houses was one hundred twenty thousand dollars. What was the median price of the three houses? So the mean equals 120,000. What is the median? Remember the mean is the average, like it says right there in the problem. The median is the middle number. So we have uh, Tom, Jane, and Sue each purchased a house. And we need to know what the middle number is. With three numbers in our set, uh, the middle number, the median can either be um, well, it'll be, it'll be the middle number when the numbers are listed chronologically. So statement one. The price of Tom's house was $100,000 or 110000 So um, unfortunately, knowing that the average was um, 120000 means we don't necessarily know what the median was. Um, because uh, Tom's is clearly on the low side of the average. So the median does not necessarily have to have equaled the average. It could be that another one was 120,000, um, or sorry, it couldn't be actually. Um, oh yeah, it could be. And then this one could be 130,000. We have one 10,000 above the average and one 10,000 below. It could have just as easily been um, 110, thousand um, one hundred twenty three thousand and one hundred twenty seven thousand so again the, the median is this one here and since it depends on what we set as our two other houses statement one is not going to be sufficient because, it, it, again, the, what the median is depends on what we have. So it's not A and it's not D. Statement 2 tells us that Jane's house was 120000 Now Jane's actually equals the mean. So the other uh, houses, if, well, uh, oh, I actually wrote these in the right order. That works out well. So Jane equals 120000 and if, if, Jane's, if Jane's house is the mean, that really only gives us two options. Um, it means that either uh, Sue and Tom each also got $120,000 houses, um, which preserves the average as the, what's stated in the problem, or whatever theirs were, whatever these are, these are the same distance from 120,000. 
because the average of 120,000 needs to be preserved. For every, let's just assume Sue's was the more expensive, however much hers is more than 120,000, Tom's needs to be less. Otherwise, the average, the mean, like it says in the problem, won't stay 120,000. Because theirs are the same distance, or if theirs are the same, in either case, 120,000 remains the median of the set. So uh, this is enough to tell us that Jane's price of 120,000, which is the mean, is also the median. So it's not C and it's not E. Statement two alone is sufficient. 282, number 106. If x and y are inter integers, is x, y even? Remember that an even number times anything, any integer, equals an even number. So is x, y even? Um, if x or y is even, then, then yes. Only if x and y are both odd is the answer no. Statement one, x equals y plus one. This tells us that the two numbers are consecutive. Whatever x is, y is one more. So if we have x and y, if x is odd, y is one more and is even. If x is even, y is one more and is odd. In both cases, we have an even number times something and so x times y is definitely even. So statement one is sufficient. We can cross off b, c, and e. Statement two, x over y um, is an even integer. So this one's a little bit trickier. That means that x divided by y equals something even. Um, and remember that an even number is two times something. That's what makes it even. So um, we can actually fill in this value. So x over y equals two times, we'll call s something. So then x times y well, so we could say then uh, x equals 2 times something times y. We multiply both sides times y. And then x times y equals x times, or sorry, y times x, which is 2 times something times y. And since we have a 2 in here, that's an even number times anything gives us an even number. This something also has to be an integer. So this is, you know, 2 times y squared times something. But it doesn't really matter what this ends up equaling. Because, the, because of this 2 here, uh, this whole expression, x times y, this is another way of writing um, x, y. Um, the whole thing is even. So... Uh, Statement two is also sufficient, so it is answer choice D. Still page 282, question number 107. So a box contains only red chips, white chips, and blue chips. If a chip is randomly selected from the box, what is the probability that the chip will either be white or blue? So to compute the probability of white or blue, we would add the two probabilities together of white over the total plus blue over the total equals white or blue probability. Okay, so if we get us if we get something that tells us what the probability is of white uh, and of blue, or if it just flat out gives us the white or blue probability, we will have sufficiency. Statement one tells us that the probability that the chip will be blue is one fifth. 
So that tells us that blue over total equals one fifth. But for sufficiency, we need the white and the blue. So this alone is not going to be sufficient. It's not A and it's not D. Statement two tells us that the probability that the chip will be red is one three, one, one over three. Red over total is one third. So this is a little bit of a trick here because there are only three types of chips in this box. So if the, to if the probability of getting a red is one out of three, the probability of not red equals two out of three because the probability of what you want, red or out of the total, and the probability of what you don't want, not red, um, those need to add together to be one. So one third plus two thirds equals one. In this particular case though, not red equals the probability of white or blue because there's only the three colors in the box. So this one, by giving us the probability of what we didn't want to happen, it inadvertently gave us the probability of what we did want to happen. White or blue has a two and three chance of happening if red has a one and three chance. Statement two is sufficient. It is answer choice B. All right, last one in this column on page 282, question number 108. I'm obviously rushing a little bit both to get those extra questions done and because the question after this one is complicated. So um, question number 108. If the successive tick marks shown on the number line above are equally spaced and if x and y are the numbers designated the end points of intervals as shown, what is the value of x? So we have a number line. And how many do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this one's 0. And then 1, 2, 3, we have x. It's an x, and then one, two, three, four, we have y. Okay, so we need to know basically what is the value of y. y equals, who knows? Let's look at the statements. Statement one tells us that x equals one half, which is useful because that gives us, that allows us to figure out what each of these intervals, each of these, um, each of these marks on the number line represents. X is three marks, you know, uh, one, two, three distances from zero, and that equals one half. So if we divide, X's distance from zero is one half, uh, and we divide that by three, we can figure out what each of these marks will be. Uh, dividing by 3 is the same thing as multiplying times its reciprocal, which equals 1 half times 1 third. So every mark on this, on this line equals 1 sixth. So uh, we just figure out what y is. 1, 6, 2, 6, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. y equals 7 sixths. Statement 1 is sufficient for us to answer the question, so it's not b, c, or e. Statement 2 tells us that y minus x equals 2 thirds. So that tells us that this distance here is 2 thirds. And again, we can divide that distance by the number of pieces it's been evenly divided into according to the question. That's four pieces. So 2 thirds divided by four is the same thing as 2 thirds times one-fourth, we get two-twelfths, or one-sixth. Again, each piece is one-sixth, and we can figure out that y equals seven-sixths. Also sufficient, it is answer choice D. Okay, so still page 282, question number 109. In triangle ABC, point X is the midpoint of side AC and point Y is the midpoint of BC. 
if point R is the midpoint of segment line segment XC and point S is the midpoint of seg line segment YC, what is the area of triangular region RCS? Wow, okay, so we draw a triangle. And we can make it A, B, C. So point X is the midpoint of AC. Okay. Um, and point Y is the midpoint of BC. And point R is the midpoint of XC. And Point S is the midpoint of YC. They want to know what the area of triangle RCS is. Yeah, I know. So, um, however, the fact that these things are midpoints makes things easier. Let's just imagine we're figuring out the area of um, triangle ABC. Okay, so the area of triangle triangle ABC equals one half the base times the height. So if we knew the value of AC and the value of whatever the height is, um, that would be that. <laughs> um, so what we're actually after is the base times the height of angle RCS. Uh, so we know that the base, we do know the base in terms of the um, value of the larger triangle. So because X times C is one half of the base, R times C being the midpoint of the midpoint thing, um, RC is one fourth of the base. We also know that, uh, that each of these triangles, if we were to draw another one here, that these are all proportional. So in going halfway down this line here, we've reduced the height half by half. So B to Y is one half of the height of the triangle. Y to C is the other half. So therefore S to C is one quarter of the height of the triangle. So the area of RCS is one half of one fourth of the base times one fourth of the height of the big triangle ABC. Multiply all that out if we want, um, it equals one thirty second of the base times the height of ABC. So let's look at those statements and see what we get. Statement one tells us the area of triangular region ABX is 32. So that tells us that this, sorry, ABX. So let's just imagine there's that triangle. Now, since x is the midpoint of that base, we know that triangle ABX is um, one half, you know, one half base times height. But that its base is one half of the base of the full triangle ABC. So it's one half of one half of the base, but the height is the same number. You know, we we drew this perpendicular here. times the height. So the area of ABX equals one fourth base times the height, and that equaled 32. So we know we can multiply both sides times 32 to get this value for BH and plug that into our original equation and figure out one thirty-second of that. So this actually would be sufficient for us to determine the area of triangular region RCS. We're not going to figure it out, but we could. Statement one is sufficient, so it's not B, C, or E. I didn't leave a whole lot of room for statement two, but that's okay because it doesn't give us much. The length of one of the altitudes of triangle ABC is eight. So some altitude somewhere, um, an altitude being a, a measure of height, um, <clears throat> it could be this BX that we 
or it could be, um, I probably should have had another color here, but it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, could have been any of those things. Knowing one of those is eight does not help us solve the rest of the triangle because we don't know what shape the triangle is. If it's equilateral, yeah, sure, but we don't know that, so it's not sufficient. So statement two, insufficient, so it's not E, it is A. Still page 282. Actually, we're not gonna get off page 282, question number 110. The product of the units digit, the tens digit, and the hundreds digit of the positive integer m is 96. What is the units digit of m? So units times tens times hundreds equals 96. So um, that tells us everything that we know so far. So uh, statement one tells us that m is odd. So if m itself is odd, m is a three digit number, that means that the last digit itself is odd. So that means the units digit is odd. And the units digit has to be a factor of 96. So the prime factorization of 96, let's find out how many odd numbers are in there. Well, we can divide by three, and that's three times 32. 32 is 4 times 8, which is 2 times 2, 2 times 4, and itself 2 times 2. So every other factor of 96 is even except for the number 3. Since the units digit needs to be odd because the m, m, m number itself was odd, um, the uh, units digit has to equal 3. Um, and that's what the number was asked. That's what the question is asking for: is what the units digit of m is. So this is sufficient. It's not b on its own, um, nor is it c or e. Statement two: the hundreds digit of m is eight. Um, so that tells us that the I probably should have written this as h times t times u because that's the order they'd be in. Hundreds digit is the one to the left. So this tells us that the hundreds digit equals 8. Well, you know, if we divide 96 by 8, we get 12. So 96 divided by 8 equals 12, which tells us that, um, so h times t times u equaled 96. 8 times t times u equals still equals 96, t times u equals 12. Now all we know then is that t and u are factors of 12, single digit factors of 12, but they could be uh, 2 and 6 or 3 and 4 or vice versa. So with four different possibilities, it could be 6 and 2 and 4 and 3, there are four different possibilities for what the units, digits, do, units digit of m is from statement 2, it's insufficient. And a is our answer. Number 111, 282, number 111. A department manager distributed a number of pens, pencils, and pads among the staff in the department with each staff member receiving X pens, Y pencils, and Z pads. How many staff members were there in the department? So, pens, pencils and pads are X, Y, and Z. Nothing we can do but hit the statements. Statement one, the numbers of pens, pencils, and pads that each staff member received were in the ratio two to three to four respectively. Two to three to four. The question is asking how many staff members there are in the department. Knowing the ratio tells us nothing. Uh, we know that uh, this is in a, this is a multiple of nine. The staff members will be a multiple of nine, but there could be nine, or there could be nine hundred. So, 
or any number in between or even greater. So this is insufficient on its own. It's not A or D. Statement two tells us the manager distributed a total of 18 pens, 27 pencils, and 36 pads. 18, 27, and 36. Okay. So, uh, this alone, of course, doesn't tell us how many staff members there are because we don't know how many each people, how many each person got. Uh, each of these numbers is divisible by three, uh, by nine, um, and so we still don't actually know. Um, also, then, even in con so this one's not sufficient on its own. So it's not B. All that's left is looking at them in conjunction. And at first, it looks like these two should be sufficient. We have the ratio and we have the actual numbers. Um, the issue is, of course, that this ratio could be something um, trickier. That is to say, um, this could just as easily be the ratio 6 to 9 to 12. which if it is, um, so if the ratio is 2 to 3 to 4, um, there are 9 staff members, so in conjunction. So if it's 2, 3, 4, there are 9 staff members, but if, it's, if the, the real numbers of staff people were 6, 9, and 12, or, or, or excuse me, if the ratio of pens, pencils, and pads is 2, 3, 4, but the actual numbers given out were 6, 9, and 12, there are only 3 staff members. Um, and both of these work for the original ratio given. 6 to 9 to 12 is the same thing as 2 to 3 to 4. So without knowing um, whether the ratio had been simplified at all, we don't know how many staff members there were. So even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient. So beware uh, when you get the actual numbers, beware that it may be more than, there may be more than one multiple of the ratio you're given. Okay, two more problems. I think we can make it. 282, question number 112. Machines X and Y produced identical bottles at different constant rates. Machine X, operating alone for four hours, filled part of a production lot. Then machine Y, operating alone for three hours, filled the rest of this lot. How many hours would it have taken machine X, operating alone, to fill the entire production lot? Okay, so uh, we do know that um, uh, four times machine X's rate, um, four hours at machine X's rate plus three hours at machine Y's rate equaled the production lot uh, of, and we're trying to figure out what X would have been doing on its own. So um, X's rate times some mystery time So doing X, this is uh, the whole thing, X doing the whole thing at, at its own rate at some time that we don't know, and then this is what actually happened with X and Y both doing it. But beyond that, we don't really have anything. Statement 1 tells us that machine X produced 30 bottles per minute. So X equals 30 per minute. And so that means it produced 1,800 per hour, which is nice. And we could figure out how many that is over four hours, but there's no Y in this one. So without knowing how fast y, how much Y did in its time, we don't know how much more X would have had to do. So this one's insufficient on its own. It's not A and it's not B. Statement two. Machine X produced twice as many bottles in four hours as machine Y produced in three hours. Right. So, um, we know that, um, let's see, how should we do this? Um, so four times, uh, four hours at X's rate equaled uh, twice the amount that Y produced in its three hours. 
So 4x equals 6y, x equals 4 sixth y, therefore x equals 2 thirds y. Oh, haha, <laughs> 6 fourths, wow. That makes the math totally different. All right, so x equals 6 fourths y, and therefore x equals 3 halves of y. Which also, the converse of that is y equals 2 thirds of x. From there, we can actually fill, figure out the rest um, of the equation. So using our original equation from the beginning, so we could say, uh, we can use either one. We're solving for t, so it doesn't matter which one we do. Let's use uh, this guy. x equals 3 halves y. So 4 times uh, 3 halves y plus 3y um, equals and again, x is 3 halves y, 3 halves y times t. So we have 12 halves y plus, um, well, we can do uh, 6 halves y equals 3 halves y times t. Multiply everything by 2, 12y plus 6y equals 3yt, divide by y, and add them together. So we end up with 18 equals 3t, t equals 6. So that actually, and so it would be 6 hours for machine x on its own. Statement 2 is sufficient. We can cross off c and e and circle b. Last one. Oh, no, it's not the, oh, no, it is the last one. Okay, good. Afraid I didn't get through them all. 282, question number 113. So, on a company sponsored cruise, two thirds of the passengers were company employees and the remaining passengers were their guests. If three quarters of the company employee passengers were managers, what was the number of company employee passengers who were not managers? So, um, Two-thirds are employees, um, one-third are guests, and three-quarters of the company employees, so three-fourths of the two-thirds are managers, so that's uh, six-twelfths, or one-half are managers, and this is of the total population. And then the question is, what was the number of company employee passengers who were not managers? So um, if we can figure out any of these numbers, we can figure out the rest. So statement one. Um, oh, so the other way then is uh, one quarter of the um, two thirds who were um, company employees are not managers. So that's two twelfths. Well, one sixth, one sixth of the total population are not managers. That's what we're trying to figure out. So statement one on its own tells us that there were six hundred ninety passengers on the cruise. Well, we know that one sixth of six hundred ninety were not managers. We don't even have to do. Wow. Long day apparently. Six ninety equals total. We would just do 690 divided by 6, and that equals the number that are not managers. So that's sufficient on its own. It's not B, nor is it C or E. Statement 2 tells us there were 230 passengers who were guests of the company employees. This tells us the same thing. Um, 230 equals the guests, and we know that one-third of the people, one-third of the total equals the guests, so three times... 230 gives us the total, and then we would divide that by 6 equals the number that are not managers, because we had all of the fractions figured out in advance. So this one's also sufficient. Statement 2 is sufficient as well. Statement 1, either one, that gives us answer choice D. 
Okay, I had, to, I had to rush a little bit to get through that one to get us back caught up to the published schedule, and I'm sorry about that. If you have questions, let me know. Send me a Grocket message, um, and I'll be happy to answer it. Uh, in any case, though, we are back on schedule. My name is Jim Jacobson. You've been watching Grocket and its OGTV broadcast of the 12th edition to the of the official guide to the GMAT. And next time... We will pick up on page 283 with question number 114 in the data sufficiency section. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, and I hope to see you next time.